Hi, I'm Dave McLaren, and I'd like to welcome to the uh, CLF Research Facility. This is home of GNL Guitars on Fender Avenue in the city of Fullerton, California. Uh, today, we're going to have a look around inside at some of the uh, the facility, uh, as particularly a lot of the neat historical aspects of it, because this this building was built by Leo Fender, and we're going to have a lot of neat stuff that's uh, that's not only of the the era where we made GNL guitars here, but other things beforehand. It's going to be fun, so we hope you enjoy it. The Haas machines, these CNC machines, we use them to do uh, what I call like the dirty work, sort of the, the heavy lifting. We use these to replace what were called pin routers. It was sort of the mid-century manufacturing technology that Leo Fender used back in the um, 1950s and 1960s at the Fender Company. Essentially, you would have a template screwed onto a block of wood and push it around while a big rotating bit would come down. You know, it was somewhat dangerous, some say, and we ran those until 2006. Uh, and in place of those, we use the uh, Haas VF4s, and that just does the dirty work. The beautiful thing I think about this shop is while it has a couple of pieces of the modern tech, they're only used to replace sort of the dangerous, dirty stuff. And beyond that, all the handwork is still done the same way it's always been done here. And this building is, uh, it's been operational since 1976, when the, um, the first, uh, the uh, other brand of instruments were made. <laughs> so let's take a look at a couple of machines. For example, if you look at these machines and you look at these benches, they're all made with uh, what's called angle iron. And this is very simple stuff to chop and weld together. And historians that are familiar with uh, the old Fender factory, you know, way back in old pictures and so forth, they would see benches and machines made out of the same angle iron. And that's because this place was constructed sort of like a similar way as to what Leo had made work at his Fender company before he'd sold it. So things like this that will shape, do a little edge of sanding on the sides of neck, you know, freehand, these are Leo machines. So they're things that he'd already pioneered before he created this factory and opened it in 1976. Uh, if we look at things like this, uh, the fret presses, some of these things well predate even this factory, but they were with Leo. So we have even some benches and toolings and things that was once served time at the Fender Company, make, you know, use in Fender production, later used in, uh, well, in Music Man production here, and then GNL pro production. So these things, they look like ordinary factory floor objects, but many of them are quite old and, and I think really contribute to the, the feel of history here. You know, it started with rich tapestry. It's even beyond the brand that we, we make here today, but all of the brands that Leo Fender touched. And we can, in ordinary artifacts like benches, those things sort of, I feel like resonate sort of. So old benches, old presses. We don't use these often now, but what these are is this is for putting the radius on the fingerboard. This is the old-fashioned Leo Fender method. So you would have the neck screwed on facing down, right, with a flat, flat radius on the top, and you would have the sanding and rock this, and they would move it to other parts of the belt to make sure it's nice and smooth. But this would put the radius in the fingerboard, and you could adjust these to length, so whether you might have a, say, like, uh, I think this might be 12-inch radius, or let's say on an early Telecaster, they would lower it and have say a seven and a quarter inch radius, little arm like that. So what you're seeing here is an artifact, while it is of this era here, the building, 1970s, it's very much the same thing as what would have made Fender guitars in the late 1950s, through the certainly through the mid 1960s. And once you put the radius on, you would go to another machine over here, and this would put the front slots on and the slot for the nut. Well, well, we don't use this today. You're looking at, if you wanted to see, what did it look like in the 50s and 60s when all those old magical things, this is exactly what it looked like. This, this I call the Hall of Fame because in trying to get that beautiful edge feel and have it repeated, it has to be kind of like religion. They have to be like touchstones. 
you know. So I thought we're going to have great examples of you know common our best profiles, most common profiles right here, so everyone can is welcome and encouraged to pick it up and touch it because when you're doing so much of this fine detail work, the, the difference between magic and not. It's done by hand and you need a reference point sometimes to check in to make sure that your perception hasn't drifted, right? So the Hall of Fame with uh, Happy Leo is here. If you look at this, uh, this Delta Rockwell bandsaw, this is actually from the early 1960s. And this traveled with Leo Fender. So when Leo Fender moved his office and laboratory out of the Fender company to his CLF research, Clarence Leo Fender Research uh, building, which was nearby until it moved here, CLF Research, uh, this was once in uh, Fender's R&D. And it was in Leo's little shop there, and it traveled with him. A beautiful Delta Rockwell, early 60s. I think it's... Uh, it just needed a few bits. Actually, my brother has already restored the bits that have to go on here. But we're gonna move this down to Custom Shop because they've been, they, they really wanna have this beautiful old Leo Fender's bandsaw, you know? Looking at these, the carts and the benches, again, they're all the same construction, the angle iron. In fact, all of these carts and these Leo machines like the sander here, they were all constructed by a man named Ronnie Beers. And Ronnie Beers worked for CLF Research as a uh, sort of a handyman. He did all kinds of stuff. He could fabricate all kinds of stuff with metal and wood and so forth. And, Lee, and uh, um, Ronnie worked for Leo at Fender. So when he left to start his CLF Research, you know, in 1966, Ronnie came with him. So Ronnie never left. He kept working all the way until he spent his last years uh, working here. And uh, so all these, even the machines that look like the old Fender machines were made by the same guy. Isn't that crazy? But everything is kept in good working order. Just because it's old doesn't mean that it's, it's bad. In fact, in many regards, these old machines that, that we are kind of infinitely rebuildable and replaceable, they, were, they have a solidity to them as though they were built to last you know, they weren't thinking five years, ten years. It's like they assumed they should last for decades and decades with maintenance. And that's sort of like something that I, I, I feel was in the GNL instruments, where if you look at the Satellock Bridge, how, how beefy that is. Everything felt like it was military, industrial quality and grade, so it was designed to last forever. And I want that, those attributes of the machines and the things that Leo left us, to, to really be felt in the instruments that we make today. That they have that same kind of feel of quality and precision and care that Leo put into this factory, Leo put in the instruments, and the people who made his machines put into that. We are in the paint shop here at the uh, CLF Research Factory, home of GNL uh, Instruments, and uh, even these uh, the paint boots here. These are also as old as this building. So as you can see, what's left of the original permits from 1975. <laughs> I don't know what, how long that piece of paper is still going to last there, but you know, it's it's. It's just awesome to think that this artifact, again, you know, the permit from Leo Fender's time is still active. So it's sort of like with even things permitting, it's sort of like I have to sit in his seat now and take care of things like that. It's still Leo Fender's thing, but you know, I have to now drive. It's the odd things to where you feel like, where you realize that now with, with his now having his company is like, okay, you have to now take care of things that he personally took care of, you know? And that's sometimes the connection of them where you see the things that are with Leo Fender on it. It strike, it, sometimes it hits me, it's like, whoa, this is a responsibility that I have. You know, this is, it's not just any guitar company. I have to be sort of a steward of, of his ship, you know?
So I have to look out for these things. And, but, I, but I cherish things like that. Just an old, an ancient permit on the wall. But the thousands and thousands of uh, guitars and basses that have gone through here since you know, 1976, it's just, and you think about all the smiles they've put on people's faces all over the world. It's things like that, just, just, a, just an old paint booth. It just, it feels magical to me, you know? It's like, I don't wanna replace anything. I wanna to try to keep the old things going as long as I can, you know? You can, but again, things like this are quite serviceable, these good American Binx boots, you know? Okay, we're in the polish department now, and uh, is this body's come in here. You can see this. I don't know if you can see in this light. There's a there's what we call orange peel in the paint. You know, all that is is just the natural sort of peaks and valleys. After you you paint it, you're going to have some of that effect. Um, now, regardless of how well you've applied the paint, you've prepared that. A lot of the the sort of magic, if you will, that that people describe the GLNs. They, they say, hey, you, the finishes are immaculate, they, they, and they, they focus a lot on the paint because that's what they, they think, but a lot of the beauty comes from the polishing. So, you know, you could look at um, a mass production uh, car that's red, or you could look at uh, a Ferrari that's red, and most, maybe they look kind of the same from a distance. As you get up close, you see the Ferrari, and it's like still water, you know? You look at that beautiful, smooth, glassy, to it. That's the work of the polish department. And what we do here with the cut and buff really isn't any different than what a lot of people do. I think we just tend to be, we tend to do more of it, frankly. It's not magic, it's just, it's just effort. But I think it really shows and, and uh, Leo Fender left a very high standard for us. So the things that we inherited here were his standards. So. I can't let it be below that. I have to be that or better. Otherwise, I always feel like he'd be, I always imagine him in, my, in the back of my mind and, he, and it, him saying, is that the best you can do? So I always feel like I gotta go, I gotta push because I can't have Leo Fender in the back of my mind going, is that the best you can do? No, I gotta feel like he's in the back of my mind going, that's okay, or just that little, little bit of a smile that he'd give you, a bit of approval. That's what I go for. And, and well, this thing just came in here and it's had a beautiful uh, paint work done. It's when it leaves here after the polish guys, that's when it has that beautiful GNL sign. Something we started doing just a few years ago, and I really kind of dig this, is uh, our USA instruments here, we laser in the serial number on the, on the uh, back of the headstock. And the reason why that is, is let's say, Later on, you need a, a repair to the neck. Uh, you have a warranty repair or whatever the hell it is. You need a new neck. And most companies, like your serial number, if, you're, if you can replace the neck, it's full time, you get another serial number. I, I can't handle that. It's like if, I, if my car goes in, I can't get a new VIN number. You know? And for some people, that serial number could be like, they saw it uh, and, and it was like their, uh, you know, their wife's birthday. It could be anything like that. It could be a special, number for some reason, or they just like looking at it. They don't want to change it, it was lucky. So if, now we can make a replacement neck, and we're doing it even for instruments built way back to 1980 uh, for people, and we can put serial numbers or things like that on that laser then, so we don't have to, uh, no one ever has to get a new uh, VIN number on, on their uh, USA GNL. So before we did this, we had these little plates that we put on the back of the neck, and. People call them license plates, but I thought the benefit to that is, should you replace the neck, you can just that we we or the techs can put that on, and these are closely held, so that it's not like there's a bunch of them out there on the list. Uh, but that's, I guess, the reason why I'm telling you that because is when I think of people buying the instruments and, and bonding with that, I want to create a bond that's that's not, it's not something that's uh, it's flighting. It's just it's a temporary thing. I want people to bond with that instrument, and should something happen, to the best of our ability as a company, the feeling of what you had is restored. You know what I mean? That experience, even if God help you, you need a neck, the people understand what that feels like and want to do the best they can to make you still have that same feeling, you know? That's, I guess that's the point of that. 
The only reason why that is I just wanted to make it easier for people to continue that experience and us to be able to deliver that. As simple as a serial number, but it means things to people, you know? Now we're in Leo Fender's lab. This is sort of the part of the CLF research uh, facility. Um, everything, all the, the benches and things like that you see in here, these even predate this building. So before 1975, when this building was constructed, uh, the ben Leo's benches and things, they were at a place nearby on Elm Street while this was being built. And before then, it was inside the Fender Company. So people wonder why is there stuff that looks so much like benches and things that look clearly older than this mid-70s building. That's because these were just his workshop that was one within the Fender Company. So this is this story. I'll just share this one with you because I just learned this one last year. For all these years, I had no idea why these, these benches were painted a different color. Because usually these the benches uh, and the uh, inside the lab and inside the, uh, the factory, as we saw out there, you see these angle iron things with the uh, plywood tops and plywood backs. But they would be just maybe silver with just a natural color on the top. But these ones were painted over, and I didn't know why. And my brother explained it to me. He said, well, at the time when, they, when Fender was experimenting with the, you know, the pastel colors, they would get samples of paint and so forth. And when you get the samples of paint, what do you do with the sample after it's done? So they ended up having all these these little cans of samples of paint around, so things would start to get painted. And, and this was a prototype of the surf green. And Leo thought this, this bright color would be good for his benches because, as you can see, he's got all these little parts and so forth. The little parts is much easier to find on a light colored surface than the dark that he was used to. So that's how Leo Fender's benches became painted in prototype surf green. The only things, uh, of all the benches, these are the only ones. So, but that's why this is uh, the heart of this. And inside this room, really, this is where Leo Fender's, sort of his personal mission, um, the brands faded away. And it just became his own personal mission. And we can see things in here that technologically, they were the seeds of something that germinated much later where you could see him working on an idea. Maybe he hits a wall and it stops. And then it could be 10, 15 years later, he comes back to it, he has an aha moment. And in the case of this, what we call the CLF 6768 uh, prototype, it's sort of Telecaster shaped. The original intent was that they would be sort of like a, a premium model above the Telecaster. So it would be, so you have two pickups, you know, so it's kind of targeted that market as opposed to say like a Stratocaster kind of thing. Uh, but by this time, uh, you see the, the, the split coil configuration. Well, that's so he would be naturally humbucking. And Leo was, once, he'd, once he had switched to this in his mind, he gets what he called the percussive sound, which was his Fender sound, how he would describe his sound. You'd get the percussive single coil sound, but without the hum. And he, he settled on this. So after like, say the electric 12, boom, he was, he was really into this idea. So this would incorporate those, but they would also be lightly wound because it would depend on a full-time preamp. And this was, you know, barely, you know, what, 1967. So this is kind of, far out stuff that he was he was looking at. And this bridge was engineered to try to capture more of the string energy. And as it moves over this little uh, arm, it's actually pivoting to press against the end grain of the wood. But this is a complicated bridge to manufacture, to use. So it was conceptually a neat idea because you could get more string energy to press the end grain of the wood because the vibration is preferred to travel with the end grain of the wood as opposed to against it. But at the time, it just wasn't, it wasn't ready. So as 1969 drew to close, Leo Fender's consultancy with the Fender Company also drew to close and the development just sat for 50 years until last year. We decided we were going to 
bring out the instrument to see if we could make it work. So what you're looking at there is just a technical mule. But the drawing, if we can get this, we have a series of drawings where uh, styling was being worked on at the same time. So even though the bridge concept technologically it wasn't quite ready for production, they it had been drawn in here. You can see the pickups drawn in here. So this was parallel to the rush to get the styling done or get the, uh, the technical part done. There was also a movement on the styling with a couple of different versions, including like, these are all late 1969. So what we did is we just brought something out 50 years later. And as I say, it was like we finished a song. Let's say an artist passed away and there was an unfinished song from long ago and someone who was well versed in the work completed it. That's kind of what we did here. We completed it with tools and technologies that he developed later solutions and applied them to his original concept and completed the guitar, completed the song, if you will. I hope you enjoyed what uh, you saw here today, and if you're interested in a GNL guitar, please check out AmericanMusical.com. They are doing a great job with GNL. They're really into it, and I'm really stoked to have you guys here with me today. Thanks, everybody.